So thanks again for having me. For me, it's uh, it's also a great, great pleasure to be near my hometown, which is uh, Venice. So um, that's why my name is very Italian, although I didn't grow up here, but uh, it's nice for having me. Thanks, Paolo, again. So let's talk about Tommy John. These are my disclosures, nothing related to this talk. Um, this is the guy, maybe you saw his uh, picture already uh, a few times, 1974. Um, he was the first one to having this procedure, and um, now 2018, he, didn't wa he doesn't want to be uh, uh, connected to the surgery so much anymore because Tommy John is all over the place, and Frank Job only told him like half a year later that um, the, the procedure is called after his name, so Tommy John, um, and he, initially he liked the name or the, the idea that his name is connected to the surgery, but now after a few years, he doesn't like it anymore. That's a little bit of history. Um, to go into Tommy John procedure, we need to talk about medial elbow instability and the phases of throwing, because this is mostly a throwing problem. Um, and we have the highest acceleration rates in late cocking, um, what were the highest uh, loads in late cocking and acceleration phase during uh, abduction and external rotation of the shoulder. And if you look at this picture that I got from, from, uh, from Adam, thanks a lot, you see how much strain there is on the medial side of the elbow and in what kind of flexion the elbow is. So it's, it's, not, it's more than, um, it's like a, a 70 degrees flexion. Um, this one, you saw it already yesterday, the primary and secondary stabilizers. We're only talking about the ulnar sided now. And um, as you know, you always have to also consider the secondary stabilizers, which are the flexors um, in this context. And what we also need to look at is the shoulder. Um, we saw yesterday during clinical testing that uh, you, you, you need to take care of the humerus somehow. And the shoulder is so close connected to the elbow, and we know that if someone has elbow problems, like a GERD, they will have uh, shoulder problems, sorry, sorry. Uh, they will have elbow problems as well. So this is a, an emphasis that I also want to make, that don't only look at the elbow, look at your other joints as well, well the wrist and the shoulder. Um, so the forces are quite high during throwing. You see like uh, it's 64 newtons uh, valgus stress um, where, with a band that usually can take 32. Um, and then also we have medial shear forces and lateral compression forces. And this leads us uh, to, to also other problems um, that you also have to take into consideration and not just look at the medial side. So we have apophysitis, we have a uh, avulsion, we have the UCL tears that I will talk about now. We have ulnar nerve neuritis, that's very important. We talked about it yesterday a little bit already. Then we have the flexopronator mass injury. And then on the lateral side, because of the compressive forces that are very high, we have osteochondral lesions and we have various extension overload syndrome um, leading to osteophytes. So this, we have to not look only at the ligaments, but all of these diseases around the elbow in the thrower. Um, so um, this is a little bit... Um, Another part, we have also have to look if it's acute, acute on chronic or uh, chronic disease. If it's an acute disease or acute avulsion, um, primary repair is, is considered with good outcomes. Um, I don't agree so much with, um, uh, with Michel before because he said we have the same outcomes if you do a secondary repair than a primary repair. And they have good return to play. And then acute on chronic, uh, it depends on where um, where the injury is. Usually it goes into reconstruction, and the chronic, they go with graft augmentation, so meaning reconstruction. Uh, Job he, himself, he uh, had a very low, well, very low, uh, quite low return to play and high complication rate. With the new uh, techniques, it got much better, but still um, we need to tell the patient that return to play is always an issue. And um, the basis of everything is, are there any arthritic changes already in the, in the elbow joint? Because this is uh, a bad outcome predictor. 
Um, with conservative treatment, 42 uh, returned to the same level. Um, and this is what I said already yesterday, 87% are interligamentous, and this is mostly the chronic situation in the picture. And then there is an acute pop, so if it's really uh, interligamentous, then you have to go for a graft. If it's a pure humoral or pure ulnar, you can still consider uh, like a primary repair, but usually it's, if it's a chronic disease, you have to go for uh, augmentation with the graft. And this, this picture, it's funny, we saw it, I saw, you saw it before. So the anterior band is under 90 degrees of flexion, and then progressively the posterior band takes over. And as you saw before, we were at uh, um, less than 90 degrees uh, of flexion, so um, the anterior band is the more, more important, and this is the part that we try to reconstruct. Um, I'm not really talking about the Tommy John procedure, but about the modified, because Tommy John, he detached the flexors completely, he transposed the ulnar nerve, and um, there are better outcomes if you don't do this. Uh, Chris Almat showed that. Um, this is how it should look in the end. We, we talked about uh, the anatomy already, sublime tubercle, and then the medial epicondyle, and this is how the graft should look like more or less in the end. So, we're not talking about one procedure, but about many procedures. Um, this is a, a busy slide, I'm sorry, and I'm trying not to make so busy slides, but I think this is needed. So either you have an ulnar single bundle, you can do it, so you just reconstruct the, the anterior band. Then ulnar double bundle, transhumeral humeral, uh, transcondylar humeral, then humeral condylar and figure of eight. And here are the pros and cons. So the good thing if you do a single bundle is that you need a short graft. If you have a long graft, uh, you can go uh, for a double bundle, which has a high stability. You don't need any implant, but the risk for a fracture is quite high. Um, and uh, the ulnar nerve you always need to, uh, to address. And when you go to the humeral side, a transcondylar, you have a good tension of the, of the graft but um, you have humoral kinking because it's not the natural course of the graft because it will, it will kink for at least 45 degrees. Uh, humoral condylar, you don't have any kinking, but you can fracture the, the epicondyle. And then figure of eight, uh, you have some tunnels, also with a risk of a fracture, low costs, uh, and you, it's very difficult to, to really uh, to have a good tension of the graft. Um, so I won't go through every step of the operation because you, you, I think it, it will be too much, but just some, some general thoughts about it. So we have a setting, we have supine, we have a tourniquet. Um, I don't do any prior arthroscopy um, because um, either I do it like a few weeks before because you need to change intra positioning. Uh, at least I, I do a lateral decubitus and then going from lateral decubitus to, to the medial side. I did that a few times, but it's, it's a hassle. Um, then you need to take a tendon, take whatever tendon you like. If the patient has a palmaris longus, of course you have to check it before anesthesia if he has, otherwise uh, you, you, should, you shouldn't take the median nerve, it's not as stable uh, as, <laughs> as the graft. <laughs> and um, then to a medial approach, always check the ulnar nerve. I think uh, I emphasize that enough and I can't emphasize it too much. And this is a nice set. Uh, I am not uh, related to Arthrex, but they, they really have a nice set for, uh, it makes it quite easy um, to reconstruct the um, ulnar collateral lig ligament. They have a, a guide where you have like more or less 45 or 55 degrees of angulation and then you can pass the graft distally and then proximally you, always, you also make um, a condylar. I, I told you before it's not transcondylar but a condylar uh, drill hole and then you have the second, uh, the two other drill holes um, to have your, your graft passed through and uh, I like the guide. Um, but you don't need it. What you need to know is that on the ulnar side you need a bony bridge. It needs to be big enough, otherwise you're in trouble. And when you're in trouble, you're really in trouble there. Um, and then uh, five millimeters on the humeral side, more or less, and two uh, sliding holes. 
So this is all not transcondular um, I'm showing you because I didn't have such nice pictures and I didn't perform uh, any Tommy John since I know from the talk so that's why I had to take uh, pictures from uh, from uh, Killian's book more or less. Uh, so um, this is uh, the distal part is on the right side and the proximal part is on the left side so here you can see uh, the two uh, uh, K wires already in the uh, ulna then the drill holes, then you pass uh, the graft through the drill holes, which is not that easy uh, to, to, to shuttle it. And then you go on the proximal part, and here on the proximal part, you either do, uh, like they do, a transcondular, or you do the condular, as I, as I showed you before, uh, with a nice, um, with a better angulation, I think, of the graft. That's how I do it then. And uh, this is, in the end, how it looks like from the x-ray they do a, a compression screw um, but uh, yeah the, the the advantage is that you can have a nice graft tensioning um, but uh, the disadvantage is the kinking of course so the ulnar nerve at least visualize it maybe even de decompress it if they have problems um, then it makes it easier if you go from distally to proximally uh, to, to expose uh, the medial part then ulna drilling first, and then try to find more or less the isometric point. There is no is isometric point on the lateral, uh, on the medial side. There is on the lateral side, so that's why um, I don't think it's that important. But still, if you can check, check it, and if you're completely out, uh, don't drill there. Uh, then tightening of the graft at 70 degrees, and I think the most important part is uh, that you cannot have a too tight graft; it will always loosen a little bit. Um, well, don't dissect the, um, the flexors uh, too much of the anterior medial epicondyle. Um, just um, leave as much as you can to have a good exposure, but still you need exposure. And then avoid going uh, too much, prox uh, too much um, posterior on the posterior side because you might have excessive bleeding and uh, calcification later. And then uh, check always the ulnar nerve uh, for any retractors you put. Um, then um, the graft arming, it's, it's obvious and everyone knows it, and everyone knows it. Um, check, uh, just arming the graft makes it shorter. So if you have a 10 centimeter graft, uh, then you, you're still okay, but uh, arming it will make it shorter. Post-op regime is a brace. Um, but they can move free in, uh, um, in physical therapy and I always give them indomethacin, well, uh, indomethacin derivative because in Switzerland we don't have indomethacin itself anymore. So, to take home, ulnar nerve is essential. Check it preoperatively, check it intraoperatively and address concomitant lesions. So, um, there is, there it's, it's also a good way to go to do first arthroscopy to check for your uh, stability, then to address um, ulnar uh, osteophytes, and then go for a, a, a repair, um, a big, uh, um, an augmentation later. Primary repair in acute rupture is a good way. Uh, you don't need to always reconstruct. And if in doubt, do a graft augmentation. Um, and no graft can be too tight, but malpositioned. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and again, Basel Elbow.